All Suicide Silence fans think Suicide Silence is the best band ever, which they are not. What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we're here to talk about a band that in my opinion defined and maybe perfected deathcore, Suicide Silence. Every so often a band comes along that just totally changes the game and defines their genre. For example, Earth Crisis did that with like vegan straight edge hardcore, Meshuggah did that with Gent, Killswitch Engage did it with, you know, whatever you want to call that version of metalcore, and in my opinion, Suicide Silence did that with deathcore. They have been shamelessly imitated and copied and ripped off a zillion times, but in my opinion, nobody has done it better than they did. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about the impact that they had, why they took off so fast, and get into a little bit about their legacy. Because even though they were just absolutely despised by the metal nerd tastemakers and gatekeepers at the time, I think that's starting to change and they're starting to get the respect that they have always deserved. But first, before I get into it, I wanna just quickly thank everybody who has supported me on on Patreon. Patrons can get access to an audio only podcast version of all the videos. They get some exclusive live streams. There's a private Discord server. There's a bunch of other perks. If you're interested, there's a link in the description. Again, thank you very much to everybody who supports me on Patreon. You take the sting out of it when my videos get copyright claimed. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Part one, setting the stage. The band started in 2002 in Southern California at the beginning of what became a very cool, very vibrant scene that was being called Deathcore at the time. And as you might guess from the name, Deathcore pretty much described what these bands were doing. They were combining death metal and hardcore in various combinations. And these days that idea is of course very common, but at the time it was a pretty new concept. And it sounded something like this. <laughs> or this. And some of the names you might recognize from their scene from that early to mid 2000s Inland Empire scene, and obviously not all of these bands are deathcore by any means, but just to kind of give you an idea of the scene they came up in, some of those bands would include Carnifex, Winds of Plague, As Blood Runs Black, Terror, Impending Doom, Stick to Your Guns, and The Ghost Inside, among many, many other less well-known bands. And while I loved a lot of the deathcore bands coming up in that scene at that time, and some of them had started to get a decent amount of hype at the national level, like Carnifex, for example, but none of them had really taken off outside Southern California at that time. None of them blew up and made a global impact the way that Suicide Silence was going to do in just a few years. All their riffs are all chugga chugga riffs. Like, all their riffs are basically breakdown riffs. Part two, they came out swinging. A lot of bands take a while to get good. Like, maybe they were a little too eager to get into the studio or something, and their first recording comes out really bad, you know, like Avenged Sevenfold, or maybe their lineup takes a couple years to come together or whatever. There's a million reasons why bands maybe take a little bit to find their groove, but that really wasn't the case for Suicide Silence. Their first release isn't their strongest, but man, they were pretty damn good basically right out out of the gate. This is their very first demo from 2003 when they'd been a band for maybe a year. And note that this is not Mitch on vocals. Now I'm not going to say that's the best thing I've ever heard, but for a basically brand new band, that's pretty damn sick. And then in the next year, they released their Notorious Family Guy demo, which is called that because they used a bunch of Family Guy samples between songs. And here's what it sounds like. And this is Mitch. This is their first recording with Mitch. A little bit rough around the edges, sure, but they were that goddamn good this early in their career, which is pretty amazing to me. No disrespect meant to their first vocalist. He was fine, a solid vocalist, but this is where you see the difference between solid and okay and elite. Mitch was on that elite tier as a vocalist, and you can hear what a difference that makes and how much that adds to the music. And then they put out another demo in 2005, and that is what I think really put them on the map. And listening to it now, I can see why, because this thing is honestly sick. It's actually probably the most just straight up brutal thing they ever did. It's almost like borderline grind and kind of reminds me of a band, maybe not quite as extreme, but kind of reminds me of a band like Orchidectomy. Listening to it now, I'm kind of actually shocked at how brutal it is. Yeah. 
on that CD, it was like one of those enhanced CDs where if you put it in your computer, there's like videos and whatever on it. On that CD, there's a live video for the song Destruction of a Statue. And that video got passed around a lot online. And I think it made a big difference because watching that video, which is just a local show, even then you could tell how fucking good they were live and also get a sense of Mitch's incredible stage presence and huge charisma. So with that in mind, it's pretty obvious to me why they got as much buzz as they did and why they ended up signing the Century Media in 2006. The fucking people who like Suicide Silence are the biggest fucking dipshits ever. Which brings us to part three, the Deathcore 2.0 era. So I said in the intro that Suicide Silence defined Deathcore twice, and this era is the first time they did it. When they released their first album in 2007, The Cleansing, and then the follow-up, No Time to Bleed, in 2009. And although these albums are a couple years apart, I'm just going to talk about them together because to me they're part of the same era of the band and of Deathcore in general. And just because I like putting dumb sounding labels on things, I like to divide Deathcore into basically three eras. The first era, Deathcore 1.0, was drawing largely from like the melodic death metal side of things from kind of the at the gates realm of bands and i think as blood runs black is probably the best example of what i would consider like the deathcore 1.0 kind of sound And then we have the Deathcore 2.0 era, or as I like to think of it, the Brutal Kid era, to borrow a term from YourScenesucks.com, if you remember that site. And in my opinion, Suicide Silence, specifically these two albums, were really largely responsible for ushering in that Brutal Kid Deathcore 2.0 era. Because these two albums took Deathcore in a way, way more extreme direction than what bands like As Blood Runs Black were doing. Where those bands were drawing from like melodic death metal, Deathcore 2.0 was drawing more from grindcore, slam, and brutal death metal, and that quickly became the dominant sound for Deathcore bands after, I don't know, 2008 or so. You had just legions of those brutal kids popping up all over the place, starting literally hundreds of Suicide Silence knockoff bands. There was like a new one every week. And yes, I'm very aware that they weren't the only ones doing this style. There was Whitechapel, Job for a Cowboy, Carnifex, and some other bands that were doing it. But in my opinion, Suicide Silence not only did it best, but as far as I'm aware, they were also the most popular during that era. The Cleansing went to number 94 on Billboard, and No Time to Bleed went to number 32. Now, those aren't obviously top of the charts, but that's pretty damn good for a young band playing such extreme music in 2008, 2009, right? And I'm going to go into more detail about this in another section of this video, but I think there are really two main factors for why they blew up. On a musical level, they combine brutal death metal with the groove and rawness and energy of hardcore in a way that really I don't think anybody had done before, at least not as well as they did it. And just kind of a quick tangent here, I always thought it was really funny how much the metal snobs hated them back then and wrote them off as like emo or whatever, because to me, if you listen to this, it has a lot more in common with Cannibal Corpse or even like Last Days of Humanity than it does escape the fate, right? And yes, I'm aware I probably just made some metal nerd's brain explode by comparing them to Cannibal Corpse or Last Days of Humanity, but honestly, it's just the truth. I guess I'll start with everybody's favorite part of the band, at least all their little fucking sceny kids who seem to like love Suicide Silence. The first thing they ever talk about is Mitch Luker. And then the second reason for them blowing up was, well, Mitch. First of all, his vocals are just ridiculously good. Again, listen to that first demo to hear what they sound like with a vocalist that's, you you know, not bad, but not a Mitch's level. Then listen to their demo with Mitch and the difference is just night and day. His ability to fulfill that role of the front man, like his stage presence, his good looks, let's just be honest, and just that off the charts charisma, that was the real game changer, in my opinion, on top of the music. I mean, you look at him on stage, even at a local show from that era, and you can see that he just totally dominated the room. And then off stage, he had that really chill, easygoing, friendly kind of demeanor that made their super heavy music accessible to people who I think would normally have been intimidated to check out a death metal or grindcore band. Mitch was just the kind of guy 
guy that you felt like you could go up and shoot the shit with, right? And just to really underscore how much people liked him, I didn't know Mitch personally, but we have a lot of mutual friends, and I've literally never heard anyone say a single bad thing about him. And that's pretty remarkable in a scene where people talk a lot of shit. So anyway, to kind of sum up this era of deathcore and why I think Suicide Silence was the band that stood head and shoulders above the rest, basically they came along in a time when everyone else was kind of doing that at the gates with generic breakdowns kind of thing. They came along and introduced a whole new breed of deathcore that was just insanely brutal and aggressive and made that other stuff just kind of sound dated to me. And on top of that, they did it with one of the best vocalists and most charismatic frontmen of that whole generation as the face of the band. But this was just the beginning. See, the people that love Suicide Silence love, like, Slipknot. Suicide Silence is basically, like, the new, like, it's new metal. Part 4, Deathcore 3.0. Now, they would have still been huge legends in my book if all they released was those two albums, but it didn't stop there. In 2011, they released their third album called The Black Crown, which once again made a huge impact on the genre. If the As Blood Runs Black, Mellow Death kind of style was Deathcore 1.0 and the brutal style like they did on The Cleansing and No Time to Bleed was Deathcore 2.0, then Deathcore 3.0 was defined by the influence of new Metal. And while again, they weren't the very first band ever to kind of bring new Metal into Deathcore, I do think that this is the album that really opened the door for Deathcore bands to bring in those new Metal albums. As one example, check out their song OCD from this album. Right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. And then once Suicide Silence did it, that told everybody else that it was okay to do it. And from there, it's off to the races. I would say we're still in the Deathcore 3.0 era now. So not only did they bring us into the Deathcore 2.0 era, they also brought us into the Deathcore 3.0 era. And although that album came out in 2011, I don't know, it sounds pretty damn current to me. And what that tells me is exactly how far they've always been ahead of the curve and that this album was no exception. How does it go? It's like... Which brings us to part five, how they established their sonic fingerprint. Before I move on to the final section of the video, I just wanted to take a minute to really get into the details of what makes their music so special, because I've never really heard anybody talk about that. Why have their albums stood the test of time in a genre where, to be honest, almost nothing from that era holds up today? Well, I have a few thoughts. First of all, and this is a common thread that you'll see with some of the other elite bands that I've talked about, like Bring Me the Horizon and A Day to Remember, they've always invested in really great top-tier production and worked with the very best producers in the game. And that might sound obvious, but I'm not sure that it is. And if you don't believe me, go back and listen to some of the other like MySpace era deathcore bands, like deathcore 2.0 bands. The production on the vast majority of that stuff is fucking just straight up terrible. And I think it really held a lot of those bands back. I think it's a big part of why those albums are really hard to listen to now. For example, like the first Born of Osiris album, just it sounds rough. And when I say the best producers in the game, I mean the very best producers in the game. For example, The Cleansing, which I think sounds just fucking amazing, that album was mixed by a guy named Tua Madsen, who's also done bands like Meshuga, August Burns Red, and Dark Tranquility. No Time to Bleed, which is objectively speaking, probably a little bit better sounding album. That album was produced by the one and only Machine, who has also produced bands like Lamb of God, Fall Out Boy, and White Zombie, among many, many, many others. And his assistant during that era was Will Putney. And Will Putney has gone on to become probably like the hottest current metal producer. He's worked with a bunch of bands like Knocked Loose and Thy Art is Murder, among among many others. And then for the Black Crown, they got the one and only, the motherfucking legend, my friend Steve Evitz to produce it. And if you don't know Steve, you gotta look him up. He's produced bands like Sepultura, Saves the Day, Dillinger Escape Plan, Turmoil, Lifetime. His credits are insane. That is a list of producers that you just can't fuck with. Those guys couldn't make a bad record if their life depended on it. And the fact that Suicide Silence chose to work with those guys tells you a lot about where their bar is set in terms of quality. And the fact that they pushed themselves to make truly great recordings like that really set them apart from their peers who, like I said, had maybe at best okay recordings. As kind of one example of that, and I'm not trying to throw them under the bus, I just randomly picked this as an example, check out this Rose Funeral mix for an example of what I would say a typical deathcore recording sounded like back then.
I mean, it's not awful, right? But just think about how much better it would have been if they had gone the suicide silence route and went to a guy like Machine or Steve Evans. And second, in the studio, they stayed true to their vision of what they wanted to sound like. They did things their way, even when it was quote unquote wrong, according to the playbook of how you're supposed to do things. For example, on the cleansing, they recorded everything live, like everybody in the same room all at once playing along together. And if you're not familiar with the recording process, like nobody does that. That is not done, especially for heavy bands. The normal thing is that everyone records their parts separately. They might not even be at the studio the same day together. And then you just redo your parts over and over and over until they're perfect, right? And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, that's how most bands do things. But I think there is maybe an element of like rawness and spontaneity that's hard to get when you record things that way. And then on the other hand, when you listen to the cleansing, you can totally hear that they did it live. It is just so fucking aggressive and raw. You can totally hear that like practice room rehearsal kind of energy. And on No Time to Bleed, they did a couple other cool kind of unorthodox things too. Like I said, I'm fortunate enough to call the producer Machine a friend. We had him on Nail the Mix last year to mix Redneck by Lamb of God. And he told me some really cool stuff about when he was recording No Time to Bleed. My favorite one, you guys have seen how Mitch sings on stage, right? Where he like puts his foot up on the monitors and like bends over, like almost bends himself in half. Mitch knew that that was how he would do his best vocal performances. And so Machine made him this like custom vocal vocal booth sort of thing so that he could sing like he does live with his foot up on the monitor bent over cupping the mic which also you're not supposed to do totally i'm creating a chamber of fucking ill for him to sing into (laughs) i'm gonna stick his mic in there i'm gonna make him push his face into it like we were just toying around with you know how he sings and what what makes him do what he does and his whole feel and his body stance. Everything about that is like totally wrong from the textbook perspective of how to record vocals, but obviously the results speak for themselves. They knew exactly what they wanted to do and how to bring that vision to life in a way that very few bands do. Anyway, I could go on forever about their production because I'm a huge nerd about that. Like those fucking filthy, nasty guitar tones and that ringy snare, which is like the best thing ever. Like I could just listen to that snare all day long. But you get the idea. I think this is a really big part of what made them so special, that they had that really specific, unorthodox idea of what they wanted to get out of the studio, and that they weren't afraid to break the rules. And also, when it comes to choosing producers, that they didn't like settle for their buddy down the street that has a studio and would cut them a good deal. They went after the best guys on the planet who would push them and coach them to get the very best performances that they possibly could. Like suicide Silence, they're gonna fucking go away. They're gonna fade away. They're not gonna stick. They're not gonna stick around. There's no way Suicide Silence is gonna be around longer than for like a year. And that brings us to part six, the legacy. Now, I'm kind of talking about the band in this video like they're not a band anymore or something, like they broke up, but obviously that's not true. Mitch unfortunately died in 2012, as most of you probably know, RIP Mitch, but they're still around, they're still going strong, and honestly, they're still really fucking good. Like, You Can't Stop Me is a damn good record. The self-titled one from 2017, in my personal opinion, was maybe a bit of a misstep, kind of a weird record, but I get it. They're in a tough spot because if they don't change anything, then people are going to say that they're just trying to recreate the past. They should just move on, like quit trying to do No Time to Bleed over and over again. And then if they do change something, well, then they ruin the band and they should go back to their old style, right? Like you just can't win in that situation. And I don't know anybody in the band, but it's got to be a tough spot. So I'm not going to be the guy to throw stones at them from the sidelines. Because the bottom line is that for me, they will always be the deathcore band. They define the genre twice, first in that deathcore 2.0 brutal kid era on the cleansing and no time to bleed, and then again in the deathcore 3.0 new metal era on the black crown. And how many bands can say that they made that kind of an impact on their genre? And lastly, even if you're one of those nerds who hated them for being a scene band or whatever, the fact of the matter is that they were the gateway for thousands and thousands of kids all over the world to get into extreme metal, whether those kids want to admit it or not. You go find the biggest death metal snob you know, the biggest black metal hipster you can find, and if they're between the ages of 25 and 30, there's a 98% chance that there's a Suicide Silence shirt in a box at their parents' house because they wore that thing to school four times a week when they were 16. 
All right, guys, that's it for me. That is my two cents on how Suicide Silence defined Deathcore, how they changed the game not once, but twice, and why I personally think that they are the best Deathcore band of all time. That's what I think. Before I sign off, I wanna quickly thank all the people who support me at the true cult level, <laughs> and that is Ryan W, Andy M, Justin H, Jeff W, Nick G, and Anthony C. Thank you guys very much. You are true cult fans, and I appreciate your support. So yeah, if you like this video, if you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, consider checking that out at the link below. And let me know what you thought about this video. Do you remember how much people hated them when they came out? Do you remember how much like the metal nerds just absolutely despised? Were they a gateway band for you like they were for so many other people? Did you graduate to get into real metal after listening to Suicide Silence as a kid? Also, I'd love to know what you guys think of their new material and the future of the bands. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.